All right, everybody, welcome back. In this episode, we're taking Isaiah chapter 35. Uh, we're going to see a restoration of the land and of the people. We'll just jump into the first two verses where the land is restored. Verse 1, The wilderness and the wasteland shall be glad for them, and the desert shall rejoice and blossom as the rose. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice, even with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given to it, the excellence of Carmel and Sharon. They shall see the glory of the Lord, the excellency of our God. So after the judgment of the nations described in Isaiah 34, God's going to bring a beautiful restoration. And this promise was proved true in many ways, and in some ways, um, in some sense, will yet be fulfilled. The promise was true in the immediate term when Judah was restored after the invasion of the Assyrians was turned back. This promise was true in the longer term as modern-day Israel has turned the wilderness and the wasteland into productive farms and truly has made the desert blossom as the rose. And this promise will be true in the ultimate fulfillment of this prophecy when God restores the ecology of the world after the end of the Great Tribulation and the Battle of Armageddon in Isaiah 11, verses 6-9. through 9. So Romans chapter 8, verses 19 through 22 will say, The earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. Nature is waiting for the transformation that will come when the Messiah reigns and believers are glorified. Right, Glorified meaning we are removed from the presence of sin altogether and we get a resurrected body to be in the presence of the Lord. And so verses 3 and 4. Weak people are going to be strengthened here. Verse 3. Strengthen the weak hands and make firm the feeble knees. Say to those who are fearful hearted, be strong, do not fear. Behold, your God will come with vengeance, with the recompense of God, and he will come and save you. So the coming judgment would be enough to make the hands of anybody weak, the knees of anybody feeble. But in light of the glorious restoration God will bring from that time, it will be no time to have weak hands or feeble knees. God wants his people to get strong and to get going. We use our hands to work with. Those with weak hands are not working for the Lord as they should. We use our knees to progress with and pray with. Those people with feeble knees cannot progress and pray as they should. And so Hebrews chapter 12, verse 12, will quote this verse from Isaiah to make the point that even in a time of chastening or correcting from the Lord, that we should take strength and courage from in the Lord, knowing that it is his fatherly love and care that has allowed and directed that correcting uh, or chastening. It's time to get strong in the Lord and move on, right? Just like a father or a mother will discipline their child, the Lord will do that to us. It's his fatherly love to keep us in line. But the passage both here in Isaiah and Hebrews chapter 12 will indicate that there are some among God's people who indeed have weak hands and feeble knees. What's the cause of it? Um, if we're not making progress in our walk with Jesus Christ, fault can surely be found with weak hands and feeble knees. And in our present trials, we need the strong hope of the Lord to overcome our fearful hearts. Uh, fearful hearts are not helped by vain or vague optimism. They're helped by the assured confidence that he's going to come and save. Right? Verses 5 and 6. We're going to see the sick and diseased healed. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then the lame shall leap like a deer, and the tongue of the dumb sing. So when God's salvation comes, miraculous power comes with it. It's a miracle for the blind to see, the deaf to hear, the lame to run, the mute to speak. Uh, but when he, God, will come and save you, he's going to do it with miraculous power. And so, shall be opened. Let's look at this. When John the Baptist was in prison, he became discouraged and began to wonder if Jesus really was the Messiah that he proclaimed uh, 
that he proclaimed him to be. When John's disciples brought this question to Jesus, he replied, Go and tell John the things which you hear and see. The blind see and the lame walk. The lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear. The deaf are raised up and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he who is not offended because of me. And that's in Matthew chapter 11 verses 4 through 6. If Jesus didn't use the exact words of Isaiah chapter 35, he certainly used the idea. And so Jesus the Messiah had come to bring God's salvation, and that was going to be accompanied by miraculous power. All right, verse 6 and 7, abundance is going to replace lack. Right, verse 6, For water shall burst forth in the wilderness, and streams in the desert. The parched ground shall become a pool, and the thirsty land springs of water. In the habitation of jackals where each lay, there shall be grass with reeds and rushes. So when this salvation comes from God, there's going to be miraculous provision to come with it. What was dry and useless before is going to become well watered and fruitful. And Jesus said that he was going to bring this kind of beautiful provision in the lives of his people. Where he says, He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. But this God spoke concerning the Spirit, whom those believing in him would receive. In John chapter 7, verses 38 and 39. There is no reason for a Christian to endure a dry time, not when the miraculous power of Jesus Christ to provide is present. And so the parched ground was going to become a pool. And the word translated parched ground actually means mirage or air reflection or an atmospheric phenomenon that's seen in the eastern deserts that's caused by a reflection of hot rays in the sun. You've seen it in cartoons. They think there's an oasis in the, in the distance. Looks like a water out there. Now the, the prophet is going to say that what used to be a mere semblance and an illusion is one day going to become a glorious reality. This won't be a mirage. It's actually going to be water. All right, verse 8. A highway of holiness is made for God's people. All right, verse 8. A highway shall be there and a road, and it shall be called the highway of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it, but it shall be for others. Whoever walks the road, although a fool, shall not go astray. So today we take good roads for granted, but in the ancient world, a highway was an amazing blessing for travel, progress, business. And Isaiah announces that in the ministry of the Messiah, there's going to be this wonderful highway, a road known as the Highway of Holiness. And the Hebrew word for highway indicates what our English word literally says, a highway like high, a high dash way. It speaks of a raised road lifted above the ground. It's high glorious road to travel on. And so this construction of this highway of holiness was the greatest engineering feat ever accomplished. Engineering has done a lot to tunnel mountains, to bridge abysses, but the greatest triumph of engineering is that which made a way from sin to holiness, from death to life, from condemnation to perfection. Who can make a road over the mountains of our iniquities but Almighty God? And none but the Lord of love would have wished it. But none but the God of wisdom could have devised it. None but the God of power could have carried it out. And so the unclean shall not pass over it. So this highway isn't for everyone. It has a toll booth. But you can't make it on this highway by paying your way. You're only allowed on this highway if you're cleansed by the great work of the Messiah, right? He did it. He paid our way. It's his works that we rely on, not ours. And then out of that, his good nature through us produces good works. But still, all credit goes to God. So when we stick on God's highway of holiness, even though his work in us isn't complete yet we may still be in some ways a fool. Yet we're safe because we're on his highway, God's highway. There are guardrails, uh, thankfully some tall ones on the dangerous curves, and he's going to keep us from falling off as he develops wisdom and maturity in us that's going to keep us on this highway. All right, verse 9, the safety of this highway of holiness. No lion shall be there, nor shall any ravenous beast go up on it. It shall not be found there, but the redeemed shall walk there. Right. So as we stay on this God's uh, highway, we're protected from the lion, 
First uh, Peter chapter five verse eight will say, "Though your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour." So that lion has never yet devoured anyone who stayed on the road. So the promise is sure: no lion will be there <clears throat> in the spiritual sense and physical. I'm sure. Verse ten: the travelers on this highway. And the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing, with everlasting joy on their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness, and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. So we use this highway of holiness to come to where God lives and reigns, Zion. And we come there with singing. God's going to put song in our hearts as we travel on his highway. And so the word ransomed is related to the word go well, which means kinsman, redeemer. And it refers to the one who's been rescued by the Goel. And you'll remember this from our study. Ruth is a huge book. It's only four chapters, but it is all about the Goel, the kinsman redeemer. And Jesus Christ, obviously, is our kinsman redeemer because he came through uh, Mary. He came through the woman and then died on our behalf. So he's our kinsman because he became man. And he redeemed us on the cross. So we can know that a lot of the sorrowing and uh, everlasting joy is going to come and then the sorrow and sighing is going to flee away but we aren't at our destination on this highway yet when we arrive there Revelation 21 verse 4 one of my favorite passages God will wipe away every tear from their eyes and there shall be no more death no sorrow nor crying nor shall there be any more pain for the former things have passed away so using the pictures of this chapter it's as, it's as if we came to God barren, dry, blind, deaf, weak, and crippled. Then the miraculous power of Jesus comes to change us, heal us, and provide for us. And that isn't the end of God's work, though. He then goes on to make a highway of holiness that the transformed man can walk on. And the highway can be helpful to one who is barren, dry, blind, deaf, weak, and crippled. But when the highway is provided for the one who is healed... And provided for as we are in Jesus, the blessing is even more amazing. Okay, so a few questions here. Are you on that highway today? Are you making progress on that highway? Are you enjoying the travel? And are you inviting others to join you by sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ? 1 Corinthians 15 verses 1 through 4. That Christ died, buried, and rose on the third day according to the scriptures. And to believe that in our heart not in vain emptiness all right that's isaiah chapter 35 next time we'll jump into 36 and we're going to see a demoralizing attack on faith thank you for joining me